So uh, thanks a lot for coming, and I'd like to thank Petar and uh, Nathan for the uh, super egoic terror that uh, got me to come, um, despite having had a very uh, busy and uh, hideously administrative uh, last few months at my university that were kind of impeding the work of thought. Um, so, uh, yeah, in the spirit of equivocity, actually, the original paper uh, uh, titled, I'm, I'm still using the, the title, The Power of False Revolutions, as a subtitle, but now it means something completely different. The False Revolutions, the original, uh, my original intention involved discussing, in light uh, of Deleuze's theory or theorization of the powers of the false in the second of the cinema books, specifically with regards to the figure of the Fossaire or Forger and Orson Welles and other authors, um, narratives um, that propose a kind of counterfactual uh, thinking of revolutionary uh, or uh, radical political action, in particular um, a rather um, arresting uh, science uh, fiction alternative history by the American writer Terry Bisson. Um, called Fire on the Mountain. Now, um, that's a project that I'm actually working on with uh, Evan Calder-Williams, who's, who's spoken here before, and we sort of rehearsed it at a very unfortunate art event at the Palais de Tokyo in front of a very hot flame, but that's all I'll say about that. Uh, but it turned out that I didn't really cohere entirely, and uh, partly because... Uh, of the um, significance of questions regarding capital and especially money to debates about sophistry and truth, I thought it might be more uh, interesting and conducive to discussion to present um, some uh, work still in part related to Deleuze uh, around um, a question I've been trying to deal with for some time, which is the question of real abstraction or uh, of the uh, effect or impact on philosophical cognition or understanding of philosophy of the um, realization or the supposition that uh, abstractions exist in uh, economic life, uh, in exchange, in the circuits of capital before and in a sense above the way that they exist uh, uh, in the mind or indeed in philosophical speculation itself. So the false revolutions here are not revolutions that didn't happen or that uh, have been falsified, but rather the false, so to speak, or, or, or uh, the, the, the socially necessary falsity of the revolutions of capital itself uh, uh, in its uh, circuits and exchanges. So the paper is now entitled Metaphysics, Metamorphosis, and Monetization, The Power of False Revolutions, and it's in two parts. The first uh, deals with the question of money and the power of the false in Deleuze, and specifically in Deleuze's second cinema book, and the second, uh, which I hope will, even though it's a bit of a diptych, nevertheless, I hope the relation will be fairly evident, uh, deals with the figure of money in Kathleen Malabou's reading of Heidegger. Uh, and hopefully, uh, even though only the first part of this was written with sophistry in mind, the second uh, uh, will also, to some extent, cohere around this question um, of the relationship between real abstraction, falsity, and truth. So uh, I'll just start with part one. The power of the false, la puissance du faux, is a recurrent motif in the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze most forcefully in his Nietzschean philosophy, where it is associated, in Nietzsche's own words, with life's desire to mislead, to dupe, to dissimulate, to dazzle, to blind. Sapping the moral foundations of the distinction between essence and appearance. It recurs in the discussion of simulacra, of what Deleuze calls models of the pseudos, in which unfolds the power of the false indifference and repetition's evocation of an anti-Platonism at the heart of Platonism itself. More marginally, but no less interestingly, in Deleuze's 1966 celebration of the thousandth release of the Série Noire, it's a fantastic text which is published in uh, Desert Islands, 
The list details, uh, it's about five, uh, uh, five page text. He details how the detective, um, or uh, the, sorry, the deductive or Cartesian and inductive or Hobbesian traditions of the classical detective novel, in which detection is synonymous with a logical or forensic inquiry after truth, have been terminated by a new regime of the intrigue, which he sees uh, uh, spread out across the series, this, this series of, uh, uh, of pulp or detective novels, which teaches us that, in a fairly fantastic quotes of the many that one could draw from this text, as Deleuze writes, police activity has nothing to do with a metaphysical or scientific search for truth. Police work no more resembles scientific inquiry than a telephone call from an informant into police relations or mechanisms of torture resemble metaphysics. Now, of course, thinking of Benjamin's reflections of the metaphysics of the police and the critique of violence, we could parenthetically note that Deleuze is arguably too quick to announce the break in this affinity between the cop and the philosopher, or indeed perhaps between torture and metaphysics. Now, the confrontation between the opposed wills to truth of the detective and the criminal has been replaced in the Série Noire, according to Deleuze, by the protracted and entangled contest between criminal and police collectivities, in which truth is no longer, in Deleuze's eyes, the ambient element of the investigation. Instead, the Série Noire novels reveal an agon characterized by what Deleuze terms the compensation of error, which is a term I haven't found in other works by Deleuze, and in fact that use of the puissance du faux is very different, I think, in this text than elsewhere, but Deleuze speaks of this compensation of error, a phenomenon which he strangely likens to the social function of Greek, tra Greek tragedy linked to a social logic of restitution, of the restoration or the reproduction of a social equilibrium, in which the cop and the criminal do not confront each other in a specular metaphysical relation, but rather as collectives in a deep and compensatory complicity. To the extent that the dialectics of detection and criminality are revelatory of a particular social nexus, the Série Noire exudes a power of the false specific to a particularly capitalist indistinction between politics and crime. This is another one of the theses in this text, which leaves behind the socially anachronistic cunning of the detective and criminal as individuals to portray what Deleuze pointedly calls, I quote again, a capital society which more willingly pardons rape, murder, or kidnapping than a balanced check, which is its only theological crime, the crime against spirit. I'll return to such crimes against spirits shortly, but I want to linger for a while longer on the theme of the power of the false as it plays itself out in the second of Deleuze's cinema books, The Time Image. Since it will allow me to explore the theme of this intervention, namely philosophy's relationship to money, as what we could call objective sophistry. It is around the figure of Orson Welles, not just as director, but as the actor bringing to life the conceptual persona of the, or intercessor of the fausseur, the forger, or the falsifier, that Deleuze, Deleuze's account of the power of the false orbits. Following the, to my mind, uh, actually erroneous notion already pushed by André Bazin of Wells as a Nietzschean filmmaker, which I don't think is tenable, but that's not of great interest here. Deleuze rehearses a number of the themes familiar from his Nietzschean philosophy. In Wells, according to Deleuze, the system of judgment, and this is, of course, a very obsessional theme in Deleuze, to have done with judgment, the system of judgment becomes impossible precisely through the indiscernibility and undecidability between being an appearance real and imaginary. Deleuze contrasts this with the persistence of judgment in Brecht's concern with the reality of contradiction and in Fritz Lang's attention to the reality and relativity of appearances. Incidentally and parenthetically, I think one, uh, and I only realized this on a recent reading, but one of the strange negative leitmotifs mainly present in the footnotes to the cinema books is uh, Deleuze's uh, deep anti-Brechtianism, which I think would be Worth, uh, worthy uh, uh, of comment, in part because I actually think it involves a considerable misunderstanding of Brecht and a rather commonsensical understanding of, of what his work uh, uh, proposes. Now Deleuze returns again and again to the Hall of Mirrors scene in The Lady of Shanghai, uh, 
corroborating, I think, Rancière's rather acute remark, that in searching for the marks of his periodization, of a shift between image regimes, so from the movement image to the time image, Deleuze cannot help repeatedly turning to allegories, even though Deleuze al always wants to talk about the direct presentation of time and the, and the crisis of the sensory motor relationship between movement, action, and representation, he constantly resorts, and I think Rancière is quite right about this, to allegories of this breakdown, to allegories of this crisis that are entirely uh, inseparable from uh, um, an order of representation and of, and of narrativity. Um, in a sense, undermining the kind of ontological cast of his inquiry. Inasmuch as a Nietzschean lesson that the collapse of essence is also the collapse of appearance is assumed by Wells, he opens up to a world of multiple forces without a center. Again, these are the themes that recur from the Nietzschean philosophy books into the chapter on the power of the false in cinema two. Uh, a world of multiple forces without a center, dramatized in the figure uh, of these bearers of exhausted force. And there's a great kind of uh, comment by Deleuze about the role of these figures of who have exhausted their force as sort of, uh, again, uh, kind of allegories of a, of a Nietzschean uh, theory. Bannister and the Lady from Shanghai, Quinlan and Touch of Evil, Arcadian and Confidential Rapport, these kind of omnipotent impotence that Wells is so uh, uh, attached to representing. Conversely, Wells' Nietzschean conviction, again, according to Deleuze, the becoming um, is life's power uh, of the false lies behind his sympathy for figures of what he calls generosity. And this is indeed a term that Wells returns to uh, in his interviews with Bazin, generosity being for Wells the only virtue, which I think is an interesting uh, suggestion. Figures who, in a very familiar Deleuzean theme, oppose becoming to history and are incommensurable to judgment, fundamentally innocent like Don Quixote or Falstaff. Now, this characterization of Wells depends on a thesis that is both metaphysical and metahistorical regarding the time image itself. Wells is not just an artist of the power of the false, which turns out to be the same as what Deleuze calls the metamorphosis of truth, which he identifies with art and its creativity. Wells is, in Cain, the inventor of the time image for Deleuze. So these two things are very much tied up with one another. Even though, of course, the narrative of the power of the false is crystallized uh, uh, in the uh, much later uh, uh, film of um, Wells or a peculiar documentary film forgery of Wells, which is F for fake, which plays quite an important role in Deleuze's argument. Now, this image, the time image, of which Wells is the um, seismograph and inventor with Kane, uh, is the product of a crisis. The crisis of a sensory motor regime which linked action and representation in the movement image, subordinating time whose, to movement, a time whose only representation was indirect, in terms of an open totality that received its kind of summa, its cinematic summa in Eisenstein's Hegelian cinema, according to Deleuze, um, in the subordination of this uh, indirect totality of time uh, to movement and to the exigencies of action. The Deleuze places the crisis in the immediate, well, in the war and the immediate post-war period with the proliferation of situations, as he puts it, to which no reaction is adapted. And this is why, uh, in a sense, the, the emblem of this crisis of the sensory motor image is the, uh, well, is Antonioni's cinema in general, but in particular Red Desert. And uh, Deleuze actually quite um, cleverly plays on this statement by Antonioni uh, ruining the fact that he'd been entirely misunderstood, that he made some uh, film uh, about the horror of alienated neurosis in modern uh, spaces. He was, uh, according to himself, simply representing what happens uh, to bodies that couldn't adapt to a space to which one should adapt oneself, i.e. this sort of um, space of the industrial wastes uh, of uh, northern Italy. Um, so. Though Deleuze places this crisis in the immediate post-war period, his account of it is strangely congruent with Jameson's formulation of the sundering of individual experience and systemic coordinates uh, 
in his famous essay, or rather initially talk, on the aesthetics of cognitive mapping, which was presented, in fact, the same year as the publication of the time image. Deleuze himself writes of this um, uh, crisis as a situation of non-totalizable complexity, which is not representable by a single individual, which is more or less exactly the terms that are used contemporaneously by Jameson. There would be much to say about both these periodizations, and especially about the way in which Deleuze relies on a kind of meta-historical narrative to pinpoint the collapse of history. So as you could, you know, in a sense, time or indicate the moment at which, or the period at which, historical representation and historical practice, in a sense, collapses unto itself. But I want to focus on those elements in his argument which allow us to reflect on the link between the power of the false time and money. What in Jameson's account appears as a potentially paralyzing crisis of orientation, and famously Jameson uh, avowed that cognitive mapping was just another name for class consciousness, and thus the collapse of the possibility for mapping was significant precisely because of its forms of political uh, debilitation, the collapse of mediation to core, uh, for uh, Deleuze, in impeccably Bergsonist fashion, this is turned into the occasion of a kind of ontological revelation. So it's not that Deleuze scans the fact that this is, uh, that the crisis is a really a political crisis, but for Deleuze, the political crisis, uh, the crisis of political experience and political perception is the occasion for a kind of higher or grander politics, which turns out to be indistinguishable from contemplation. The impossibility of totalizing, uh, which is the upshot of this uh, crisis uh, of the sensory motor scheme of 20th century modernity, is a precondition for Deleuze of what he calls a direct experience, or a direct presentation, rather, of time. And this presentation of time, which is dramatized cinematically, not just by Wells, but also, uh, first and foremost, by uh, Alain René and Alain Robrier, who are the focus of very lengthy and and uh, uh, captivating analyses in the second of the cinema books, is at one with a crisis of truth and of judgment. Um, as a movement practically and instrumentally oriented towards action and reaction is now subordinated to what ca Deleuze calls the voyance, or the seeing, in the sense of clairvoyance, I suppose, of time, to the con contemplation of a spiritual automaton, which Deleuze then links very improbably to my mind, to the theme of a people to come. This is a curious theme because, of course, it's a theme without a concept. Of course, Deleuze couldn't produce a concept of the people because any available historical concept of the people is the very negation of most of the uh, uh, fundamental matrix of Deleuze's uh, thinking, which I think was what makes these passages particularly uh, uh, mystifying at times. With the crisis of the sensory motor dialectic of the movement image, as Deleuze writes, a fundamentally decentered movement becomes false movement, which is again a theme that Badiou has dealt with in an essay in Handbook of Anesthetics that I won't deal with here, but it would be an interesting contrast. Both of them, of course, playing on the title of the Vim Vendors film. Uh, and Deleuze continues, fundamentally liberated time. I think this is very uh, a significant uh, phrase, you know, that. Uh, the, the collapse of the historical framing of basically political emancipation, the orientation of time in the sensory motor schema of 20th century politics and the link between action and representation, so the way in which liberation was thought, uh, becomes the occasion for a liberation of time, for a kind of ontological emancipation uh, of time, which is the strange... Um, reverse of this uh, collapse of any um, comprehensible or narrativizable idea of political liberation, in which then again I think the people to come uh, theme serves simply to indicate Deleuze's continued desire for something resembling a politics of emancipation, which is in a sense incompatible with this theme of the, of the liberation of time. The parts in which this becomes most interesting but is dealt with very scantily is in the discussion of third world cinema in, uh, uh, in Deleuze. Um, but I won't go into it uh, here, though I do think that that's the part where the, the politics of the text become uh, 
opened up to more questioning in a way that actually parallels in a strange sense uh, Jameson's own considerations about third world uh, narrative. In fact, Deleuze makes more or less the same argument uh, that uh, Jameson makes about national allegory in third world narratives, uh, to wit that you know, these are narratives in which personal experience and collective or national experience are weirdly fused into one. Now, um, without scanting the richness of formal and thematic analyses made possible by this thesis, I want to dwell on this link between falsity and time. Now here, uh, Deleuze's 1983 seminar is now uh, available in uh, 64 hours of MP3 recordings, uh, of which I've only just skimmed the very surface of the first couple of uh, seminars here, partly because I came across them last week. Um, these seminars are very useful, I think, in setting out some of the basic conceptual distinctions underlying the chapter uh, on the power of the false in the cinema books. In the seminar, Deleuze revisits the ca classical conception of truth in modern philosophy as one that considers truth as a distinction between the real and the imaginary or essence and appearance in the image, while falsity would be the confusion of um, being uh, uh, an appearance or the real and the imaginary. So Deleuze is quite adamant that actually truth is in the distinction. The truth is that the real is not the true. The true is a particular relationship, at least this is in his reading of uh, modern philosophy, a particular relationship between the real uh, uh, and the imaginary. An error would be precisely the confusion. The veridical man, the man of truth, would be he who does not confuse in the image the modification imparted to the image by his own body and soul with the true representation of the thing outside it. Deleuze is at pains to argue, and this is important, that the power of the false is not the false. The power of the false is not error itself, and the power of the false is not a celebration of confusion. Deleuze's cinematic, uh, sorry, philosophical suspicion of cinematic surrealism, and I think Deleuze's hostility to surrealism is quite important to understanding his, let's say, more epistemological argument about the nature of truth and falsity. Um, can this suspicion of cinematic surrealism, which is indexed at various points in the cinema books, can also be explained in terms of his objection to an oniric or hallucinatory temporality of confusion, which would still rely on its difference and distance from a sensory motor norm of correct representation. So um, the power of the false, or indeed this indiscernibility and um, undecidability between the actual and the virtual, which then is the object of what Deleuze calls the crystal image, is precisely not the confusion between these domains in the dream or in the hallucination, which are for Deleuze simply derivative uh, and in many ways uninteresting uh, uh, forms of surpassing truth in as much as they rely uh, on the previously existing sensory motor schema. They're just simply uh, aberrations or interruptions of this um, norm of truth that don't really undermine it. The distinction between the power of the false and the false is undergirded then between the, by the distinction between power and form. If, as Deleuze notes, uh, uh, of the axioms of 17th century philosophy, only the true has a form, and of course there's a different variant of this as was discussed in, in Nathan's introduction already uh, in our first day in uh, Plato himself. Then the false is not another form, or rather the power, the false is not another form, it is the thought of, to be thought of in terms of a power, a puissance. As Deleuze notes, there is a pouvoir du vrai, but there's no puissance du vrai. This is at least his thesis. This power works not through confusion, but through the indiscernibility and undecidability between real and imaginary, essence and appearance, but also between different tenses of time. Whence the positing of the crystal as a symbol of an image in which the real and the imaginary, the actual and the virtual image, would chase each other in a kind of circuit. Another concept which, alongside the series, is quite important to this aspect of Deleuze's argument. Incidentally, we can note in the seminars Deleuze's fascination for the position associated with Cleanthes, whereby the past is not necessarily true. In turn, we could also reflect, following some very interesting comments, since we've talked about this in the previous days, by Carlo Ginzburg uh, in an essay in Wooden Eyes on myth uh, and lying uh, in the history of philosophy, 
on how the sophistical figure of the goat stag can also open up a thinking of time beyond the existential coordinates of the past, present, and future. Um, uh, Ginsburg uh, talks about how in this figure the goat stag doesn't exist, but it is, will be, and was, precisely because of its extraction from the coordinates of that which is um, existentially verifiable. The power of the false is thus defined by Deleuze as the construction of crystalline formations and linked to a practice of description. This is a term that again returns over and over in the cinema books. A description that does not, as with the movement image or classical representation, treat its object as independent. Crystalline descriptions, unlike organic ones, that's the opposition in Deleuze, as he puts it, replace or substitute their object. The dislocation of the movement image and this new regime then open the possibility of a presentation or experience of time in its pure state, which is also a putting of truth into question. There's a whole welter of issues that could be put to Deleuze at this point. Above all, to my mind, the question, at once political and metaphysical, of what is involved in treating the crisis of action, the crisis of practice, as the occasion of a revelation of being, or of being as time. A transcendental experience, however constructed, which can only appear, or perhaps can only appear to me, as the recovery, incarnation, and redemption of a kind of truth, capital T, the truth of being whose condition is a collapse of action. Or indeed, you could even say the collapse of politics. If action is the source of the illusion that space is conserved and time is destroyed, according to Burson, to whom Deleuze here remains very faithful, then its crisis, with its curious dependence on the crisis of political organization, of political history, as well as both liberal and revolutionary politics, is the revelation of time's conservation and space's destruction. The power of the false turns out to be intimately linked to a purification, again, a theme uh, insistent throughout the cinema books, and indeed, I think, throughout Deleuze's work, purity and purification, uh, a bit of time in the pure state, as it were, that is now uh, a purification that is now no longer practical but transcendental. This purification is also an autonomization, that is to say, the autonomization of the presentation of time from movement, with Deleuze rejoining, in his own peculiar way, a trajectory of modernism as purification via Bergson. And I think here, uh, the comments uh, made in, in, in Rancière's critical review of the cinema books uh, about Deleuze's attachment to this theme of autonomization as purification within art, and the idea that somehow, um, even though he keeps saying over and over in, a, in, in the mode of disavowal, that you know, the movement image or the time image image are just two regimes and you can make awful uh, films in both. There's nevertheless a sense in which the time image does reveal something that is essential to the art of cinema. Uh, uh, and so there is, a, there is a kind of purification that you could think of along distantly Greenbergian uh, lines. Um, but the crisis of truth as the condition of a higher truth, the truth of time, has a curious precondition which brings us back to the question of money. Echoing back to his article in the Série Noire, in Time Image, Deleuze notes that cinema as an art is in a perpetual, a constant relation with the international conspiracy of money. These are his terms, not mine. Money which conditions cinema for within as, I think in a lovely expression, its most intimate enemy. This intimacy is extremely acute in the Time Image, whose potentially revelatory direct presentation of time and whose temporally unhinged series, constructed by the power of the false, are conditioned by what Deleuze calls an internal relationship, not a, you know, occasional relationship or an extrinsic relationship, but an internal relationship to money. Thus, according to Deleuze, I quote, money is the reverse of all the images that cinema shows. So the films about money are already, albeit implicitly, films in film or on film. The key examples here are Marcel Lherbier's uh, film of Zola's L'Argent uh, uh, in terms of the movement image and Bresson's uh, film L'Argent uh, uh, in terms of the time uh, image. What's more, money is intimately bound to the pure experience of time and especially of time's dislocation of true representation. 
While movement can serve as an invariant measure for a set of exchanges or as an equivalence, as Dulles writes, time is by nature the conspiracy of unequal exchange or the impossibility of an equivalence. Such that we could also link the time image to the rise, perhaps very distantly, of financial over productive accumulation of money capital or fictional capital over productive capital. The time image and the power of the false brought together in that emblematic figure of both forgery and in his own words, hustling, Orson Welles, whose career as we all know was a monetary tragic comedy on an untold scale, um, are thus really brought together by the objective sophistry of money or what Deleuze calls in a lovely expression, the infernal circuit between image and money. And again, circuit being also the theme that he uses in terms of the relationship between the virtual and the actual. Whereby the crystal image in Deleuze, uh, as he writes again, receives the principle that founds it, relaunching ceaselessly disymmetrical unequal exchange without equivalence. In cinema then, money is where the people is missing. Part two. Uh, money as actually existing metaphysics, uh, Malibu on Heidegger. To explore further this move from sophistry as the threat of mercenary knowledge against the pricelessness of philosophy and its move to money as a kind of objective sophistry, I want now to turn to another text in which money is revealed as the intimate enemy, but also in a sense the extimate principle of metaphysics, Malibu's recent reading of Heidegger, and specifically its thematization of the relationship between metamorphosis, metaphysics, and capital. I want to suggest that the non-dialectical sublation of the dialectic proposed by Malibu is troubled, proposed by Malibu, in fact, in Plasticity uh, uh, at the Dusk of Writing. writing. There you go. Uh, is troubled if we add to her polyvalent expression of the uh, Heideggerian triad that she calls WWV, Wandel, Wandlung, Verwandlung, or Change, Transformation, Metamorphosis, the U of Übergang, or Transition the problem of Marx's other change, the change against and beyond exchange. Or, to the extent that Malibu notes that her question is about transformation, I want to think in counterpoint to her work what transformation may mean in and beyond capital or beyond the form of value as the principle of our social synthesis. In a curious inversion, the problem of the social ontology of change is broached not in Malibu's writings on Hegel, where frankly it seems very tangential, at least as far as I've been able to make out, but in her more recent Le Change Heidegger, a book which has the rare capacity, I think, in terms of readings of Heidegger, of generating an impious or profane illumination um, from Heidegger's work, uh, creating in her own words a topos where the man Martin Heidegger undoubtedly would not so much have liked to see himself led guess is a good place, um, just by definition. Um, one of the topoi alien to the man Martin Heidegger, but for some oblique and superficial remarks, is a question of the ontology of capital, understood as something other than the deployment of the essence of technology or an iteration of that epical metaphysics of subjectivity. It is to this key question of dialectical thought that Malibu gestures in the conclusion of uh, her book, where she writes, I quote, there obviously exists a proximity between Heidegger and Marx, which rests no doubt on the thinking of a possible coincidence between the ontological and the economic in the definition of exchange, of exchangeability and mutability, of the metamorphosable and displaceable character of value and the impossibility of transgressing this plasticity." End of quote. But what if exchange as an originary, dispossessing origin of philosophy, expropriated the self-sufficiency of philosophy, the consistency of ontology, and the sovereignty of the philosophical. To locate the crux of the dialectic in the real abstractions of money and exchange, in the seemingly autonomous logic of the categories of capital, as Marx and a number of his more speculatively oriented commentators have done, is to suggest the possibility that, to somewhat pastiche Heidegger, the essence of philosophy is not philosophical. In other words, that inasmuch as the unique ontology of capitalism sees abstractions having a social existence external to, and in many ways indifferent to mental or philosophical abstraction, the problems of philosophy have a direct social character. And here we could uh, uh, link in part, I guess, to Alex's discussion of this question of socially necessary false consciousness. <laughs> 
This also means that philosophy can no longer propose its ethical or political mission as that of providing a conceptual synthesis for other disciplines or practices. If, as the likes of Adorno pointed out long ago, social life is already conceptual through and through, albeit in inverted and mystified ways, the notion that philosophy can propose concepts, such as plasticity, to, re to reorient our practices is also put into question. Now, Malibu's call for what she calls putting an end to the dematerialization and demonetarization of contemporary philosophy, I think, is a timely one. I'd be happy to subscribe it. But I think for this not to remain simply a mutation in the reservoir of analogies, images, or metaphors of philosophy, but a real challenge to philosophy's rather sterile dreams of self-sufficiency, it involves exploring the ways in which the conceptual or speculative character of the existence of capital forces philosophy outside of itself, obliging it to reflect on how it is constituted by abstractions that are not of the mind, spirits it can neither fasten nor totalize. To put it paradoxically, philosophy can only rematerialize to the extent that it grasps the spiritualized character of capitalism. Inasmuch as capitalism is an actually existing metaphysics, philosophy is a crucial component of any transformative analytic of social life as Marx amply demonstrated by mapping the inner dynamic of capital into the logic of Hegelian categories. But it is also revealed as increasingly obsolete in its image as a kind of ideological reservoir of worldviews that could be proposed to other practices and disciplines, such as the idea that well, we could think uh, uh, change otherwise as a sort of proposal of a worldview rather than uh, uh, a critique of actually existing abstractions. It is with respect uh, to Heidegger and not Hegel then that Malibu poses a problem of the entanglement between metaphysics and capitalism. In Heidegger's philosophy, she writes, quote, metaphysics and capitalism coincide. Hence, too, other thought and revolution coincide. This is a bold thesis. The two logics at work in Western change are generalized equivalents, Geltung, everything is equal to everything, any being can be exchanged for another according to the mercantile arrogance of calculus, and favor, Gunst, the future exchange is exchange by disappropriation. Homing in on the first of these logics, that of equivalence, commensurability, indifference, or universal exchange, is crucial uh, to my mind for any understanding of philosophy's relationship to capital. But the coincidence or identity of metaphysics and capitalism is not a symmetrical one. In fact, it could be demonstrated that in Heidegger's work, as in most philosophical reflections on the constitution of capitalism, the latter is presented as the effect of a particular metaphysics that both precedes and underlies it. So I think this is the entirely untenable uh, uh, thesis, the idea that you would locate. Uh, I think this is also the untenable thesis behind uh, Agamben's Kingdom and the Glory, incidentally, and many other recent treatments of economic theology. You would locate uh, 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 a metaphysical uh, or ontotheological matrix, which would then explain to you uh, the um, uh, social and indeed even spiritual hegemony of capitalism as a kind of epiphenomenon of what is fundamentally a philosophical story. Or indeed, uh, you know, the story of the church in Agamben's uh, uh, variant. It is because being is metaphysically configured as indifferently exchangeable as an ultimately abstract object at the disposal of arbitrary subjective will in this story that capitalism would be possible. So you would have to have the, the, uh, the kind of metaphysical fall between, before, the, before the origin of capitalism. The perspective uh, I would like to adopt instead, taking some inspiration, uh, though not alone, from Alfred Zonretel's pioneering reflections on real abstraction, that is on the origin of philosophical thought and modern subjectivity in the non-mental practice of commodity exchange and the mediations of money, is that it is the extramental logic of commodity exchange which underlies what Malibu calls Western change. And that consequently, to put it in somewhat exaggerated, but I think pertinent terms, while the essence of capitalism is not metaphysical, the essence of metaphysics is intimately entangled with coin and capital. The consequences of thinking the coincidence of capitalism and metaphysics are then considerable. Malibu's challenge in her reflections on Heidegger to think the bond between exchangeability as a capitalist and a metaphysical principle in the ambit of a radical thinking of change is to be welcomed. But in treating exchangeability as the object above all of a philosophical reflection, she risks, 
in the guise of an appeal for an other thinking, reasserting philosophy's vocation to comprehend in the sense of an encompassing and in the sense of encompassing and exhausting change itself. In a repetition of the primacy of philosophy over the domain of abstractions, which the very notion of real abstractions begins to deconstruct. This is especially evident in her allegiance to the Heideggerian motif of the originary, itself convertible with the ontological. Malibu writes of an ontological mutability that, in her words, presupposes the originary economy of an exchange before exchange, before economy, before money, before price, before sex, before commerce, before history itself. But the difference between a general metaphysical thinking of abstraction and a thinking of the determinate historical emergence of real abstractions is precisely that there is no originary economy. That economy, especially in its capacity to shape philosophical thinking behind its back, so to speak, is the dissipation of a thinking of the originary, as well as in many ways its occasion. Or to put it another way, that the origin effect is a contingent but logically self-consistent effect of a social form. The essence of philosophy is not philosophical. If we wish to test philosophy's political valences, its potential to dislocate present impasses of thought and action, we will not do this by presenting philosophy's work on itself as a prelude to the creation or reform of concepts for other disciplines and practices like plasticity. We would need to start instead from the moment of philosophy's expatriation, from a comprehension of philosophy's being be beside itself in history and science, in politics and capital, from the scandal that abstractions are in the social before they are in the mind. But this, unlike Heidegger's and Malibu's, is a totally profane before, a strictly meaningless before. We can expatriate philosophy from its morbid pieties about its Greek or Western origins, and thus truly terminate its dematerialization and demonetization. This expatriation, as we encounter in Zonreto and others who have located ontological convertibility in the social practices of ancient Greece, and here there'll be a long aside. Of course, ancient Greece was by no means a capitalist society, so then you get some very interesting arguments about the fact that Zonreto's whole argument about real abstraction and about commodity exchange is actually not an argument about capitalism. So this is a very different kettle of fish I won't get into myself, but we can discuss. Um, this expatriation then um, locates ontological convertibility in these social practices rather than in any misty realm of the spirit, uh, turning it into a matter of currency and coin. It is all the more interesting in this respect that Malibu brings our attention to some of the passages in Heidegger where the ontological scandal of money springs forth closing her book on Heidegger's musings in the essay Why Poets on Rilke and Money. The encounter of poetry in a desolate time with a form of money takes the shape of a kind of threnody, not so much for lost objects, but interestingly for lost things, for originary relations not dissolved in the corrosive circuits of currency. Heidegger quotes the following verses from Rilke's Book of Pilgrimage, the second of the Book of Hours. This is the poetic interlude. The kings of the world are old, and they will have no heirs. The sons are dying as boys, and their pale daughters gave all the sickly crowns to force. The rabble grinds them into specie. The time-serving lord of the world distends them in fire, makes them machines that grumble and serve his will. But happiness is not among them. The ore is homesick. Its desire is to forsake the coins and the wheels that teach it to live small. And from the factories and from the tills, it will return into earthly veins. The adits of the mountains close behind it on its return. The plebeian sociality of labor, timed and abstracted, uh, crystallized in this fabulous sentence, the rabble grinds them into specie, is not the site of a possible liberation, say of a species being finding in its daily grind the wherewithal to turn the coins and the wheels to better ends. As a juxtaposition between chtonic or telluric ore and worldly coin, or the natural ontological and the social ontic suggests, the poetic gaze here is one of nostalgic distress. Two passages from Milka's letters, quoted by Heidegger, reinforce this impression of poetic saying, not traversing but simply resisting the onslaught of generalized exchangeability. The first is articulated in terms of European authenticity against the banal barbarism of the new world. 
a note, of course, endlessly echoed in Heidegger's own uh, uh, lectures with their uh, rather cantankerous empty Americanism. Uh, now, writes Rilke, now from America, empty in different things. Sham things, counterfeit life, are pushing their way across, I guess, across the Atlantic uh, uh, Ocean. Capital's adoptive home simulates the ontology of the thing in the ubiquity of the commodity, whose dynamic is that of a devouring, unstoppable indifference. The second quotation is more ambiguous, finding in the sensible, supersensible nature of money a weird kind of spirituality. This is Rilke again. It's quite a lovely quote, uh, quote. The world withdraws into itself, and things for their part behave in the same way, by transferring their existence increasingly into the vibration of money, and developing for themselves a kind of spirituality there that even now exceeds their tangible reality. In the period I am dealing with, and Rilke was writing about the 14th century, money was still gold, still metal, a lovely object, the handiest, the most lucid thing of all. Yet in this contrast of the thing and the product, ore and money, as both allegory and reference point for Heidegger's confrontation with a question concerning capital, we encounter the absolute limits, or perhaps barriers, of his conception of change and the resources it may harbor for a contemporary thinking, such as the one proposed by Malibu, capable of thinking itself into and out of capital. What is most intriguing, perhaps, about the Heideggerian position, as viewed from the vantage of real abstraction, is its strangely empirical characterization of capitalism, understood not through its social forms, and above all, not through the contradictory and self-positing forms of value, but through the philosophical extrapolation of certain phenomenal contents. Thus, when Heidegger discourses about what he calls the objectiveness of technical domination over the earth, we can note that he is confounding an effect with a cause. In the absence of an account of the social and economic forms, the value forms that govern the expansion and intensification of capital, we're instead given a kind of ontological sublimation of economic words, economic images. Um, this is Heidegger. What is human about humans and thingly about things is dissolved. Within the self-assertion of producing to the calculations of the market value of a market that is not only a global market spanning the earth, but that also as the will to will markets in the essence of being and so brings all beings into the business of calculation, which dominates most fiercely precisely where numbers are not needed. In Heidegger's sublimation and metaphorization of capital, the horizon of philosoph philosophy's expatriation, what should philosophers do once they take on the fact that capital actually markets in the essence of being, such that to speak of such an essence becomes otiose, this is rescinded by treating philosophy as a critical observer of the anthropology of capital in such a way that the sources and mechanisms of capital's real abstraction are ignored. This is evident in the way that Heidegger, rather than acknowledging the determinate character of the exchange abstraction under capitalism treats exchange as a kind of exchange in general. In fact, you could argue this is also a problem with Zonretel, but again, that's by way of parentheses. Thus, commenting on Rilke, Heidegger writes the following. I quote, the self-willing man always calculates with things and people as he does with objects. That with which he has calculated turns into merchandise. Everything is constantly changed into new orderings. Risked into defenselessness in this way, man moves in the medium of business and exchanges. Self-asserting man lives by his will stakes. He lives essentially in the hazard of his essence, within the vibration of money, he's commenting on the Rilke uh, letter, and the validity of values. Man, as this constant exchanger and middleman, is the merchant. He weighs and evaluates constantly, and yet does not know the actual weight of things nor does he ever know what in him actually has weight and outweighs. The usual life of today's man is the ordinariness of self-assertion in the defenseless market of exchanges. Now, though Malibu is rightly suspicious of Heidegger's tendency to treat the bad infinite of objective exchange as an inauthenticity that could be offset by recovering the horizon of true things, the temptation in his work to form an essence, to sculpt it, to coin it like one coins money, her deriving from Heidegger of the problematic of an economy before capitalism, uh, 
fails to confront the dialectical challenge of real abstraction, namely that such an originary dimension is a fallacious extrapolation, a one-sided abstraction, to put it in Hegelian terms, from the determinate abstraction of commodity exchange. That is to say, um, the creating of this general concept uh, of exchange from a very specific, uh, uh, if historically dominant, form of exchange. Um, turning it into a kind of general philosophical law, uh, as in the following formulation, which I believe is from Malibu, yes. The economic law of being, everything beginning with being itself, constantly exchanges itself with itself between presence and presence, value and favor, property and disappropriation. Um, now, in Malibu's, uh, uh, before uh, concluding, which I will do very shortly, um, I wanted to um, uh, touch on another brief poetic and monetary uh, detour. Uh, this one uh, from a uh, passage, uh, I just want to deal with a passage in a different commentary, not Heidegger and Rilke, but Marx and Shakespeare. And this is a, a famous passage from the Timon of Athens. Um, I believe you mentioned Timon, uh, uh, Alexei, in your, in your talks. It's nicely fortuitous that uh, Marx quotes in the 1844 manuscripts. Gold, yellow, glittering, precious gold. No gods, I am no idle votarist. Thus much of this will make black white, foul fair, wrong right, base noble, old young, coward valiant. Why this will lug your priests and servants from your sides, pluck stout men's pillows from below their heads. This yellow slave will knit and break religions, bless the accursed, make the whore leprosy adored, place thieves and give them title, knee and approbation with senators on the bench. This is it that makes the wappened widow wet again. She whom the spittle house and ulcerous sores would cast the gorge at, this embalms and spices to the April day again. Come, damned earth, thou common whore of mankind that puts odds amongst the rout of nations. This monologue, of course, plays a quite important role in Marx's 1844 manuscript, used to underscore the manner in which the quantitative indifference of money can unleash the most varied and uncontainable of metamorphoses, making a mockery of stable identities or hallowed oppositions, the very creative destructive power borne by the buccaneering bourgeoisie of the Communist Manifesto. Shakespeare's delirious vision and Marx's commentary also mime the way in which a world structured by the money form insistently tries to repel it, debasing it along with the threatening forms of otherness and mixture, as in the passages of the yellow slave, the common whore. While not taking his distance from the gynophobic trope of general prostitution, which is actually a theme that returns over and over in Marx, as a dissolution of order, in his gloss on Shakespeare, Marx does, does know the intrinsic bivalence or kind of imminent hypocrisy of this monetized social ontology, which joins sovereignty and baseness, intercourse and separation, infinite dissemination, and homogenizing unity. Just wanted to read Marx's commentary and then finish with a couple of sentences. This is Marx's commentary on the time and passage. If money is the bond binding me to human life, binding society to me, connecting me with nature and man, is not money the bond of all bonds? Can it not dissolve and bind all ties? Is it not therefore also the universal agent of separation? It is the coin that really separates as well as the real binding agent, the chemical power of society. Shakespeare stresses especially two properties of money. One, this is still Marx, it is the visible divinity, the transformation of all human and natural properties into their contraries, the universal confounding and distorting of things, impossibilities are soldered together by it. Two, it is the common whore, the common procurer of peoples and nations. There's a bizarre confusion here, you know, between the whore and the pimp, which is kind of conceptually somewhat baffling, but again. The distorting and confounding of all human and natural qualities, the fraternization of impossibilities. The divine power of money lies in its character as man's estranged, alienating, and self-disposing species nature. Money is the alienated ability of mankind." End of quote. The affinity of capital's critique with capital is here writ large. After all, what better name for communism than the fraternization of impossibilities? This affinity is perhaps best regarded as an ambivalence or a kind of bivalent potentiality which haunts critical dialectical thinking's relationship to its object. It is also a mark of imminence. 
The real critique of money is not an external critique, such as we may discern in Heidegger's Rilke, but one that roots itself in the possibilities opened up by this universal confusion of traditional categories, identities, and demarcations. Thank you.